All right, yes, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Rothman. I'm the director of our Smart Cities and Internet of Things portfolio in the Office of Technology and Innovation. Um, we're here to talk about a new program that we launched in October, and we have some of our partners uh, that are working on the first uh, sort of wave of uh, emerging technology pilots that we're running in that, in that program. So you'll hear from me about the program, and then we'll, you'll hear from some of our partners who are, uh, are working with us on running some of these, these pilots. So to start, uh, we launched this program October 11th in 2023. Um, we have a website for the program, nyc.gov forward slash testbed. Um, I encourage you to visit. Um, there's an application on the site as well as information about the program itself. There's an application that you know, we encourage folks, either fo people that are um, developing products or services or academics that are doing research. Uh, we are happy to hear from anybody who has some sort of urban technology um, that they're interested in, in piloting. So uh, what is the smart city testbed that we launched? Well, we think of it as, as really an opportunity to, to reimagine how emerging technology and service delivery is piloted in, in New York City. And when I say piloted, I'm really talking about a short-term test, sort of low stakes for the city, hopefully low stakes for um, whoever's creating that technology to try to get this technology in the world, see how it functions, how uh, you know, it produces results for a city agency. Um, and so we think of it also as sort of like a front door for industry, for academics, who are developing these solutions. And they, it's an opportunity to work with um, city stakeholders. City agencies are always a part of these pilots. Um, and so we're looking sort of in a window of like six to nine months from the time in which we decide to move forward with a pilot. Like we've created a scope of work and, and we all agree on it. The, the, our city agency partners and our, um, and our vendor partners or our research partners and we're kind of creating this replicable process that makes it easier for all parties involved to be able to, to test technologies. Um, and these are just a couple of things that you know, we've, uh, we've looked at um, or are looking at uh, in terms of technologies. So this is just a screenshot of, of uh, when you get to the website, uh, there's sort of a quick link to the pilots. So these are uh, some of the pilots that we'll hear about today. There's a link to the application. Um, so we're gonna hear from a couple of folks. So, so far we've been working on three pilots. Um, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Levi, who's uh, from the company Clarity. We're working on an air quality improvement um, project with him and another company uh, who's based in the Netherlands, so they couldn't be here today. Um, and then that's all in conjunction with Department of Health. Um, and some other agency partners. And then we're also working with DCAS, uh, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, who manage the city's buildings. You'll hear more about their portfolio. Um, and uh, Building Diagnostics Robotics, who uh, you'll hear more from and are, are working on energy assessments. We are also doing a pilot um, thinking about uh, street activity monitoring using computer vision. Um, and so uh, that, that was another pilot that, uh, that we were running recently. So a little bit about how it works. Again, we're trying to have this replicable process that we can kind of assist folks through. Uh, you know, we sort of think about it as like innovation as a service for, for city agencies. So um, we've got pilot proposals that come in through the, the, the application that we've created. And we've designed that to really try to be lightweight. It's an Airtable form. You know, it's not like applying for an NSF grant or anything. You should be able to do it in like 20 to 30 minutes, uh, giving us information about what it is that you want to test, the background of, you know, your company or your research, uh, things like that. And then we sort of do a triage internally. Um, Brianna Garcia is here, who's a program manager. Uh, she and I sort of work through um, the applications that come in and, and sort of act as matchmakers um, between the applications that come in and the, uh, and the agencies that we work with. So our goal in this is to, is to launch two pilots per quarter. So eight pilots over the course of uh, this year. Um, and so working with a sort of a streamlined 
contracting process within our agency, OTI, um, working with assets. So we have partners throughout the city who may have different types of assets. This little uh, graph is, uh, or, or pictures like a city light pole, which we're using for uh, two of the pilots, or in, in the case of, uh, of working with DCAS, the city's buildings. Um, and so, you know, we have these relationships with different city agencies that we can work with and find the right location for a specific pilot. We're also going to be doing public engagement through each pilot and talking to New Yorkers and trying to understand their perspective about how this technology impacts their lives, how they think that they might be able to use the, uh, the data, if at all, um, uh, you know, what, what they think about communication and things like that. So if any of these pilots might scale, we'll be able to provide information to the agencies about the sentiment from residents here in the city, which we think is important. And then finally, an evaluation that we'll put together in conjunction with the agency partner um, and make that available across city agencies. We want to share that data with other agencies that might be interested in a particular um, area or topic, right? So kind of breaking down the silos that sometimes exist uh, within any big organization. And so making sure that if we're, you know, if we're doing something with, with DCAS and they're gaining knowledge about, uh, you know, energy management within their buildings that that could also be shared to other agencies, NYCHA or, you know, other agencies that are managing buildings and things like that. Um, so to get to this point, we did, you know, we did some research. We spoke with some other cities that were doing uh, this type of work around the city. This sort of living lab idea is very popular in Europe. Um, if you're familiar at all with any of these cities and their programs, and so there's a couple of examples here in the States. And so we sort of learned a lot through what their process was of standing up their programs. And there's also a bunch of programs here in New York City as well. Uh, the folks at the Brooklyn Navy Yard have a program. The Trust for Governors Island has a program. Our colleagues at the Economic Development Corporation have a program, uh, which in their programs are more focused on their specific assets, like on their real estate. Um, so that's one of the differentiators is that we're kind of looking citywide. Um, a little bit of data from the applications that have come in so far. Um, these are things that companies are able to sort of flag when they apply. Um, so a lot of things here with like infrastructure, asset monitoring, mobility, energy, AI, ML. Um, a lot of the projects sort of had these, these types of um, these types of attributes to them. And we'll see, um, you know, uh, a little bit more about uh, that. And so also the agencies that we've sort of shared some of these applications with, we've received a lot that were sort of related to Department of Transportation, mobility products and services, uh, also buildings as well. Um, probably not a coincidence with the climate connection that a lot of our our emissions in the city are coming from transportation and from buildings, um, NYCHA as well, and, and parks, which you know uh, occupy a lot of um, you know public space. Uh, a little bit more detail of that previous uh, graph that we showed. So just some of the other things that we're kind of bringing to the table here: uh, the agreements, doing helping with like cybersecurity reviews, and working with the Office of Information Privacy within OTI um, to make sure that we're doing all of these pilots in a, in a responsible way. Uh, I always kind of mentioned access management and things like that and the, the public engagement and evaluation. So just to sort of wrap up about the program itself, what we see as the benefits here, open, opening the access. So it's not about, oh, you found the right person at the right agency that you want to get your idea in front of, but that it's, you know, it's coming to us and we're able to funnel it and match the 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 application with the right person. We've heard that a lot from people. You know, I don't know how to get my foot in the door and who to talk to about the thing that I've been developing, the research I'm doing, the product that I'm making. So this is a way to try to democratize the access to you know um, city agencies and and uh, and city government. Um, and we're also trying to kind of break down the barriers of of minimizing you know approval process and things like that through the relationships that we have within the city, again, with contracting and procurement, 
um, having different partners and collaborators throughout different parts of not only the, the public uh, sector, but also private sector um, uh, partners that we might have, um, as well as you know, trying to improve public engagement and at the end making the data available. So that's also a goal that we have here you know, at Open Data uh, Week is to, is to have the data from the, the, the pilots available to, to folks to, to see. So now I'm gonna turn it over. We're gonna talk about some of the active uh, pilots that we have right now. Um, and uh, yeah, folks from DOHMH couldn't, couldn't be here, but I'll kind of give an overview of this air quality improvement pilot. Um, so the sponsoring agency is the Department of Health um, and Mental Hygiene. We're also working with uh, Department of Education, Environmental Protection and DOT, uh, Department of Transportation to help with like the installation and the access uh, to asset management and things like that. Uh, Clarity uh, is one of our partners and then Static Air um, is the other partner. So the device in the middle is by uh, Static Air. Uh, this is the device that actually is uh, uh, pulls a particulate matter out of ambient air using static electricity. And so this is a, you know, a pilot to see how measurable that is. Uh, as a as a product, sort of like in in open space. So, can we actively improve air quality um, in in particular parts of the city? Th there's a sphere of influence of it, as you can imagine, like an air purifier in your house. It's not sucking up all the bad stuff all over the place, but in in the area uh, near the near the um, device itself. Uh, and then we're working with Clarity, who make these. Um, uh, Node S devices, and that's what's actually collecting the data to measure the difference in, in air quality. So we've got 10 of these monitors that they've uh, provided us to, to do this baseline data. So we've done four weeks of that, um, and now we're in the process of deploying the, the three uh, static air units. And then when we turn those on, we'll be able to sort of look at the difference in air quality over that period of time. And we might, you know, as Air quality changes with seasons. We'll maybe do you know a week where they turn it. We, we turn it back off, turn it back on, and and see what those differences are. So just a little bit about the current air quality program that Department of Health runs. Um, there's a program called uh, the New York City Community Air Survey or NICAS, uh, which has been running since uh, 2008, and it's the longest running urban air quality or air monitoring program in the U.S. Um, they have over 100 sites around the city where they deploy monitors for periods of two weeks um, each season um, to track uh, that, and they, and they do annual reports about air quality. Uh, this is what one of their devices looks like uh, being installed on the far side and, and sort of a close-up shot. And these are all of the locations where um, the air quality samples are taken um, throughout the year. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, Levi Stanton from Clarity. He's going to talk a bit about air quality itself because it is a complicated, uh, sort of, uh, topic. And he's going to talk about, uh, what they're doing. Thanks, Paul. Um, since we're going to dive into air quality measurement, quick primer for everybody, uh, if you're not familiar. So air quality is an indicator of how much air pollution is in the air. So we're talking about things like particulate matter, as well as ozone and O2, uh, things like that. Um, particulate matter is a mixture, which we're going to focus on, a mixture of... Just click that to the power for the folks at home. Uh, so PM, or particulate matter, is a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets. Um, it's found in the air, and it's responsible for the it's an air pollutant that's responsible for the most premature deaths. Um, so it's really important that we understand uh, its distribution throughout our cities and how we might be able to reduce it. Um, PM two and a half, which we're going to be fo focusing on for this study, um, are also known as fine particulate matters, fine particles or particulates, um, and these are particles that are smaller than two and a half microns that can penetrate your lung barrier and enter your bloodstream, ultimately causing um, some serious health problems. Um, and fun little infographic uh, to go into the size of these. 
And fine particulate also is um, when we had the wildfire smoke events uh, last summer uh, is what contributes to the hazy orange styes that we were seeing. Um, and since we're all talking about data today, it's important to talk about how to communicate data um, when we're talking about air quality. Um, so PM2.5 um, is measured in micrograms per meter cubed. Um, but to report that, we want to be able to also communicate it in uh, while well, also comparing different pollutants. So how bad is a concentration of uh, PM2.5 compared to ozone for my personal health? Um, to do that, we leverage uh, what is called an air quality index, so the AQI, which normalizes the concentrations of various pollutants based on health-based uh, national ambient air quality standards. Um, but for PM2.5, that standard is a 24-hour average, and most people don't care about what the air quality was yesterday. They want to know what it is this hour. Um, so to do that, we use a, an outcast algorithm that looks at the past 12 hours of data and estimates what the 24-hour average would be based on the current information. And then that lets us calculate an AQI, which lets us communicate health effects messaging and cautionary statements, um, the colorful AQI indis, uh, indices that you may have been familiar with in your uh, weather app or um, on Google. But why do we care about air pollution? Well, there's many reasons, but the four pillars for me are mortality, morbidity, equity, and climate. Um, in terms of mortality, air pollution kills more than seven or causes more than seven million premature deaths annually across the world, um, and about four million of those deaths are uh, attributed to ambient or outdoor air pollution. Um, in terms of morbidity. Air pollution has negative effects to our day-to-day -day lives. It causes respiratory illness, uh, asthma, it damages our crops. So it has uh, really lasting effects on our quality of life and also our con economy. Um, in terms of equity, uh, the risk of exposure uh, is, and also the harm that it can do to people is not equally distributed. People that live in environmental justice communities are often uh, burdened more so by pollution because it's the source of it is in their backyard. Um, meanwhile, the communities like children and elderly and compromised have higher risk um, from the, the pollution. In terms of climate, it's a bit of a good story, though, because many of the actions that you might take to uh, tackle climate change or tackle air pollution have co-benefits for the other. So if we reduce um, the amount of oil that a building uh, burns to heat the building, that not only reduces the uh, climate impact of that building, also brings down the number amount of SO2 or particulates that the building is emitting um, all at the same time. So we're going to be talking about the pilot, but I want to quickly talk about where we hope this pilot will go. Um, and they're going to do so by highlighting a few cities that we're working with across the world. Um, so one is in Los Angeles, where we're working with Los Angeles Unified School District. And they use 200 of our devices distributed throughout their district um, to inform whether or not they need to be shutting down schools because of wildfire smoke impacts, whether or not they need to cancel recess. And it's allowing them to really target these actions rather than being very disruptive and having to shut down the entire district all at once. They're able to target you know, the northeast section of Los Angeles or um, you know, depending on where that smoke is going. And they have uh, real-time indicators that they have a whole elaborate dashboard um, that gives principals guidance on how to um, talk to their students and write emails to the parents and all of that. Um, in Perth, Australia, we're working with the Royal Automobile Club, which is kind of like AAA on steroids. Um, and they are, similarly to OTI, involved with a lot of uh, kind of cutting edge research. Um, they're putting out electrified buses and their autonomous vehicles. And so they're using a, a network of more than 200 of our devices to understand the benefits of um, electrical, electric vehicle uh, 
electrification of vehicles, as well as um, uh, enhancing bus routes and optimizing public transportation. Um, and in London, we're a part of a program called Breathe London, uh, which is a partnership with uh, Greater, London, Greater London Authority, as well as Imperial College London, where we have 450 of our devices deployed throughout the city, um, tied in with their regulatory network of air quality monitors, and it allows them to uh, really understand uh, borough by borough, neighborhood by neighborhood, the burden of air pollution, and also helps them understand the benefits of their ultra low emission zone, where they've gone in and banned certain types of vehicles from entering certain regions of the city. And we can really uh, effectively see the, the benefits of policies. So bring us back to New York, where we're doing our pilot with OTI and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, we provided 10 of our uh, devices, which are quite cost effective compared to uh, historic technology. Um, they're solar powered, they're cellular connected, um, and it allows us to set up a really dense network, in this case, around a school where we are piloting the, the use of the static air units. And we'll be able to evaluate the efficacy of those uh, devices um, to reduce the burden of air pollution at this school, which is surrounded by lots of light, light industry. There's a Amazon warehouse, there's a coffee roaster, there's, uh, you know, waste haulers, it's, um, there's a train track, Flushing Avenue is right below it. There's a lot of different sources of particulate pollution in this neighborhood, um, and it'll help us to see if we can reduce the burden of that on the schools. A couple pictures of our devices going up. Um, the picture on the left-hand side is showing the device deployed um, on the school ground. Um, and then the picture on the right is nearby, down the street, um, which will allow us to sort of evaluate the sphere of influence of the static air units that the, the city is also testing. Um, and then a quick look at the, some of the data that we're able to get from our devices um, through our dashboard. So all of the data are available in real time. Um, and you can see, uh, it typically, the concentrations uh, near two sensors are quite similar, but there are anomalies that happen, um, could be caused by an idling truck, a school drop-off zone where parents are idling, waiting to pick up their students, or their kids. Um, it could have been a, a trash truck. There's a bus depot nearby, um, could have been heavily. Uh, it could have been someone taking a smoke break outside by one of our sensors, um, but it really helps us uh, zero in on this community um, and the school and uh, evaluate the air pollution there. And Paul, I think I'm going to pass it back to you to talk over the stack there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'll just grab that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so just a little bit more about the, uh, the experiment here, just sort of focusing on this, this idea that, you know, this is an emerging technology. This is the first time that we've... Uh, uh, that you know the company Static Air is is doing any sort of uh, work in in the U.S. Um, so we have uh, this is a, a mock up, but we're going to have one of the. If I just go back a few slides, we'll have uh, that one unit there, sort of near the school, two on light poles, so they can be mounted on on the standard uh, DOT light poles that you see around the city. Um, and so this is an example in a different kind of a pole in, in another uh, installation that they've done. But they've, uh, I mentioned they're based in the Netherlands. They've got a couple of, uh, you know, they've got, um, you know, clients uh, around the world, a couple of uh, ones that they have here. They also have sort of a, a business around um, climbing gyms, because if anybody goes to a climbing gym, there's a lot of chalk dust that goes in the air. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is some data. So one of the things that sort of uh, encouraged us to take a look at this and to test it for ourselves uh, was a pilot that they did in Athens. And so uh, here you can see um, the blue, the dark blue, which is the, the sensor um, near um, the unit. And when they turned it on, it, it's the light blue line. And then the, uh, the, the dark line is 
not near one of the, the static air units. So you can see the sort of um, the measurements going down, PM 2.5, and it sort of averaged out to about 20% improvement. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to collecting this data, which, which, which really just uh, started. We're still doing the, the, the baseline data with the clarity sensors. Um, and I don't know if you pointed it out, but, uh, but Levi brought one here. So there's, they're nice, they're sort of small and lightweight, solar powered and um, connected uh, to the cloud via uh, cellular connectivity. So it's very infrastructure light. We were able to install 10 of those in an afternoon. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking forward to kind of collecting this data um, and, and seeing what, what comes out. And then we'll be making it available after the Department of Health team does sort of like a QA, QC on the data. They can compare it to their NICAST data um, that I mentioned before that program. Um, and then, you know, we'll find, uh, you know, either through um, the open data platform or the testbed website, um, the, the, the best way to, to make that data available. Um, and so with that, we're going to hand it over to our colleagues at Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Uh, so that's for you. So please welcome Jada Rodriguez. Hello, everyone. I'm here representing the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Department of Energy Management, other known as DCAS DEM. And essentially, we manage all things energy for public buildings in the city of New York. Um, and based on that, we've been charged with working towards the greenhouse gas emission reductions goals that the mayor has set out. Um, this includes a 40% emissions reductions for city government related operations by 2025, and that gets ratcheted up to an 80% reduction by 2050. Um, within that goal, we are also working towards a 20% reduction in building energy consumption by 2030, and we've paired these emissions and energy reductions goals with renewable energy goals as well. Uh, we have currently a 100 megawatt um, target for solar PV installations on city buildings by 2025. Uh, so the IDEA program, or the Innovative Demonstrations and Energy Adaptability Program, was created in 2014 to help the city reach these goals. Um, it's a similar program to the uh, OTI testbed uh, program that Paul's been telling us about today, but we do have a more focused um, approach um, focused on um, emissions reductions. We have completed over 40 projects since 2014 in over 60 facilities, really focused on um, technology categories, including building controls, HVAC optimization, renewable energy, energy storage, smart building systems, and most recently, building envelope. Um, and so based on this, we do have one active project with the OTI Smart City Testbed Program, and we have two other uh, projects under evaluation. Um, so what is the building envelope and how does it impact emissions reduction? Um, the building envelope is essentially the skin of the building. It's what separates the inside of the building from the outdoor environment. So this includes the roof, the walls, the windows, and the doors. Um, all of us know in a hot summer day when you walk past an open door, you feel that rush of air conditioning leaving the building. The building has to then recondition that same amount of air in order to keep the comfortable cool temperatures that we're all looking for. Um, so if we reduce the air that leaks from poorly insulated walls, from windows and doorways, we can reduce the energy usage in this space. And it is pretty impactful considering 40% of a building's energy profile comes from heating and cooling. Uh, in terms of rooftops, um, when we install solar PV projects and then have to do roof maintenance because of leaks or water issues, the systems need to be turned off and partially or fully removed from the roof for six months, if not longer than that, so that the roof work can be completed. So this reduces the amount of renewable energy that we're getting out of our investments. So if we're able to identify issues with roofs before we install the systems, we can reduce maintenance that's completed within the first five years of a system installation and improve our return on investment and our renewable energy production goals. Um, and so based on this, we've partnered with the OTI Smart City Testbed Program and the Building Diagnostics Robotics Team um, to 
scan our rooftops and our building facades to find areas um, of water penetration or air leaks um, so that we can reduce some of these problems. And with that, I will pass it off to the BDR team to talk a bit about the technology and some of the results we're seeing. Thanks, Jada. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, sorry. Thanks. There you go. Thanks, Jada. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Bilal Sher. Uh, I'm the CEO of Building Diagnostic Robotics. Uh, as Jada mentioned, we're working with DCAS and OTI to assess a number of buildings uh, throughout the city um, and look for ways that uh, basically look for defects in the rooftops and the facades uh, that uh, the city can address before putting solar systems on so that there are fewer issues with uh, solar systems and energy production. Um, so with that, I want to kind of get into um, a little bit about us and, and what we do. Um, so roof inspections uh, currently are a very labor intensive process. Uh, they involve roofing contractors or uh, engineering consultants going up there, depending on the size of the roof, it could be a very, very long day. Uh, there are roofs that are uh, the size of a, a typical US mall, half a million square feet. Uh, those can take a team of two engineers uh, or roofing consultants working 12 hour shifts over a period of three days just to get the basic information on site. Uh, so this is a very long, intensive process, um, and they, these guys will work from sun up to sundown. Um, and if anyone is actually, if anyone has done field work, they know that by the end of the day, you're pretty exhausted. You're making mistakes. You're missing stuff. Um, it's it's a very costly process, uh, particularly because the skills that you need to train these folks uh, don't happen overnight, uh, and the industry size for these folks is limited. Um, so they this is a market within which people can move around uh, very easily, very freely. Um, and uh, beyond just that, the ability, the, the, even though these guys are professionals, their productivity is high, they're still humans, their productivity is, is limited by their ability to walk around on site and collect data and record it by hand. Um, it is, I think everybody knows that there's a lot of climate goals um, throughout the United States. I mean. Uh, it's great. I think it's it's very it's it's awesome that you know the governments, um, public institutions, private institutions, uh, individuals, everybody is focused on the goal of of reducing GHG emissions, uh, and we also recognize that buildings are a huge component of that. Um, and so we're we're starting to get into a point where we're retrofitting old buildings or we're assessing them, but the skills demand to do all that is going to be lacking. Uh, the civil engineering industry was facing a shortage of people before, and it's it's going to continue facing that shortage. Um, and now with the higher demands, uh, managers really need to improve the productivity of their teams. Um, but it, it won't be possible uh, just overnight. You can't just do it with the snap of your fingers. Um, and in fact, by 2030, there's going to be such a uh, critical lack of these skills that managers will need to improve the productivity of their teams by 20% in order to meet the demands that will, they'll face um, by that time. So uh, our solution to tackling this problem um, and to really improving this um, uh, is a robotic solution. To kind of put it into, um, to, to kind of give it like a little bit more of an understanding, DCAS is responsible for about 4,000 buildings. Uh, a typical engineering team can cover about one building a day, uh, and that's if all of the weather is perfectly fine um, it hasn't rained that day, uh, and the the weather, it, 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 there's no snow on the roof, um, and the equipment that they're using can actually be used on that rooftop. So uh, in a year, you may have a company doing maybe 300, maybe 400, if they're working every single day of the year, uh, or if they have two teams or three teams. Um, DCAS's goals for 4,000 buildings can't be met in in a 10 year time frame, right? And this is the same problem that everybody is gonna face throughout the United States. Um, so the way that we've addressed this is a robotic solution. We've added, this is Rufus. Uh, he is uh, the first version of our robot. Um, Rufus is equipped with a LiDAR sensor, a 360 camera, uh, a ground penetrating radar sensor. Um, and Rufus is right now remotely controlled 
to travel across rooftops and collect data. Uh, on screen right now, we've got an image of the sort of data that Rufus currently records. He records uh, GPR data, which um, is what we see in the, uh, the, uh, the, the gray box right there. Uh, that's what we use to look for moisture in rooftops. Uh, he also records LIDAR data, which we use to map out the location of Rufus on a rooftop, uh, as well as the uh, size of the rooftop and any utility or HVAC units uh, that you'd see on there. Uh, with that, what we can do is actually very uh, accurately and efficiently map out uh, a rooftop as well as moisture on that rooftop. And so below, uh, right here, you see an image of a, a rooftop that we inspected over in Ohio, um, where the blue indicates uh, moisture that we found. And these findings actually correlate very well with uh, the professional engineers that we were working with who also assessed uh, this same building and found the same issues that we found. Um, in addition to that, we also employ uh, drone technology to scan rooftops as well, locate moisture on them, um, just to verify our, our findings. Uh, and we also use those to assess facades. Um, and with all of that information, we're really using this uh, pilot project with uh, DCAS and OTI to uh, both uh, iterate and improve on our technology as well as uh, show benefits for large portfolio owners, uh, large building portfolio owners like governments. Um, so Rufus here is, is pretty small. Um, if you wanted, we have a, uh, we, we can take them up very easily onto rooftops. We've got a little backpack that we put them onto that we can just use uh, when we climb up ladders or stairs. Uh, he is waterproof. Um, we've taken him through puddles. Uh, we've been on rooftops that look a little bit like swimming pools um, where you've just got so much water underneath the insulation. Uh, he'll run for about two hours in a single battery, um, but his batteries are hot swappable, so he doesn't need to stop. Uh, he'll stop when you stop. Um, and uh, we've got some pretty great sensors on there that record it. Our, uh, the data that we collect is actually post-processed. So uh, Rufus, as great as he is, is really just a tool for collecting data. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about data here. Uh, it's the data is very important, but it's what you do with the data that matters afterwards. Uh, so we actually take this data, this ground penetrating radar data, and we process it with a, an AI that we've trained. The AI makes determinations on moisture, but we know that this data contains other information as well. For example, if you're looking for uh, the structural components uh, right underneath the roof, you would be able to, uh, it's, they're clearly visible in some of the scans that we do. Um, and so uh, with data, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. And, you know, assessing and understanding a structure uh, is within our capabilities. Um, right now, what we do with this data is we, we process it into reports, send it off to uh, OTI um, and, uh, or sorry, to, to DCAS. Uh, and with that, we can make decisions on what portions of a rooftop uh, are uh, good to put solar panels onto and what portions of a rooftop would need uh, maintenance or repair before doing that. Um, so some of the big benefits of uh, this Rufus technology are that we don't need to send folks to site. Um, the traditional engineering consultants who used to go to site, um, once this technology is uh, properly, uh, once this technology is at the place where it is intended to be, uh, you would just need to ship this robot to site, a facilities manager or uh, a person on site could bring it up to the rooftop, uh, they could set it to go, um, and it could collect this data autonomously. Uh, the post-processing that engineers traditionally did, which would take them um, uh, days, uh, hours, days, uh, maybe even a week or two, uh, can be significantly reduced. Uh, once all of the data can be easily post-processed and put into a report. Um, depending on the size of the building, this can have outsized uh, benefits. Um, the, the robot itself is quite easy to use. Uh, we've trained, we've uh, developed it in such a way that right now uh, it's just remote controllable. It's just like driving an RC car. Uh, and it's because it's just a sensor for data collection, um, this tool is, uh, it doesn't need any special training. Um, and so the skills that the consultants previously needed to learn have been automated and, and, and incorporated into an artificial intelligence. 
Um, and it is significantly cost saving because we're reducing the amount of uh, uh, hours that a single consultant needs to be on a single building. Um, with that, I mean, since we've reduced their hours, a single consultant, if they're still involved uh, in the process, should be able to assess more buildings. And so this has uh, returns for mm -hmm. folks who have larger portfolios who need them assessed faster. Um, and so these things like this provide like a strong benefit to uh, cities and, and portfolios. Uh, and the benefit being that they can perform their work a lot faster. So since they don't need to, uh, since these are scalable, producing more than one means that you can do double uh, the uh, inspections that you would previously do, or producing four means you can do four times more. Uh, the post-processing means that all the information is av available electronically. Uh, and so you no longer need to uh, have a professional engineer's judgment involved in every single uh, assessment. Um, and because it's digital, the information is located exactly where uh, the LiDAR scans are uh, located to be. Um, the cost saving effects are, uh, the cost savings can be quite large um, because it allows, uh, because everything is automated and you no longer need those uh, human work hours involved, uh, you're able to do more uh, with less. Um, so all in all, we, we've been very thankful to receive this opportunity to pilot with uh, DCAS and OTI. Uh, they've been very awesome in terms of the, the feedback um, and, and working with them has been uh, very beneficial for us. Um, we are uh, a, very, a fairly early stage uh, startup. Um, uh, w uh, sorry, we're a very early stage startup. We're based out of New York City. Um, and so we're very glad to have the opportunity to work with uh, the New York City government to uh, push this technology forward and, and benefit the city. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Bilal. I think I'll have to keep passing that around. Um, okay, so uh, with that, um, there's a QR code if you're interested in, in um, going to the website or it's just nyc.gov forward slash testbed is the, is the shortcut. Uh, we can be emailed at, at testbed uh, at oti.nyc.gov, and that'll go to Brianna and myself. And then, uh, yeah, with that, we're gonna we're gonna go to uh, questions. We had a quick hand in the front. Yeah, so, um, I guess this program is for uh, to put sensors on city assets, and so like uh, at least when I read the description, I thought it would be access to existing sensors that either the city owns or operates, that, and data from those sensors. Mm -hmm. This program specifically for um, vendors who are creating sensors and want uh, access to platforms that the city owns. Yeah, so I mean, it could be sensors. That, that's that's part of it. I think you know what, what we've seen before or what we've seen so far. A lot of it is sensor data it's about collecting new kinds of data that we haven't collected previously um, versus you know existing technology that's out there so it's really it's a it's a piloting program for new data sources and, and new technologies that the city might be able to use um, for these you know short-term pilots just understand what these technologies can offer a city agency um, and to residents, some of the technologies that we'll be looking at going forward might be a little bit more public facing. So it could be like an amenity of some sort, um, a means of communicating um, information to, to the public directly. But uh, yeah, most of what we're doing is in service of city agencies that have, you know, um, uh, strategic goals and things like that. So we're looking to, to help them meet, meet their goals. Yeah. Uh, this is a really cool program. Uh, and I think part of what makes this program so cool is that technology procurement generally for municipal services, like technology procurement in your private sector, mm -hmm. kind of sucks. Uh, so, like, this is a great, like, step in the right direction. But, you know, it, I think you said you're doing, like, two a quarter or something like that. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, it, that's great. I'm not, like, trying to write that great. But, like, I guess my big question is, does a program like this start to influence the business as usual technology procurement? Like, does this inspire 
and do you, do you all have a vision of like kind of backdoor inspiring change to how just sort of business as usual technology procurement is done? Sure. Yeah. So I, it's a good question and, and one that I think that we get a lot, right? So this isn't the, the program isn't, um, a procurement program. It's really, you know, think of it as like a test drive, you know, you probably wouldn't just buy a car from like a review that you, that you read, you want to go and you want to actually drive the car. Um, but what happens within city government is a lot, a lot is we'll do, you know, an RFP and we have to put out a bid and, you know, we're, we're analyzing paper, um, you know, applications that come in or, you know, text, you know, be digital, but, but text, right. So making decisions, about emerging technologies just based on an application is really difficult and you it could be you know very easy to make a decision about something that's not going to work out in the end so the idea here is really to kind of help educate um, the subject matter experts and the agency stakeholders about what's out there with new technologies that maybe they haven't worked with before um, and so you know if a if one of these pilots had a, had a result that an agency was looking for, it would be up to that agency to find the right procurement path to actually acquire that technology at a, at a greater scale. And that might depend on the nature of the technology and things like that and who's selling it. There's, you know, there's sort of like a whole nother conversation to have about procurement um, within, within city government. But, you know, we're really focused on that, you know, try before you buy kind of idea to just get folks educated about what this technology could do for them um, before they make a decision, before they issue an RFP or, or anything like that. And then uh, just to plug some colleagues' work, there was a, a report that came out from the Economic Development Corporation, EDC, a couple months ago called Pilot NYC. And it's really all about how uh, a lot of these, our program, their program, a bunch of the other programs that I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of opportunities like this within New York City to really try to push innovation within the tech sector. And so, you know, there we sort of have a, a, a connection to one another. We, we meet regularly. We talk about our programs because most of these programs are really only like a year or so old. Um, and, uh, and just trying to, you know, figure out to, to your point, there's a, pro a project that EDC is working on that was in that plan called challenge-based procurement, which is, you know, can we make a call uh, for new technologies, pilot it, and then whatever, you know, the best thing that came out of that pilot can then be procured without needing to go through another procurement step, which in our case would be, you know, be something that would be um, necessary. But that challenge-based procurement program is going to be very focused on, you know, sort of a design-build kind of um, process and a process that kind of requires them to issue a, a call for a specific type of solution. So with the test bed, it's an open application. So we see technologies from all over the kind of spectrum of, of urban technology um, and that, you know, yeah, it's just, it, it just gives a kind of a wider breadth of technologies that we would look at versus saying we're looking for a solution for X issue at a given time. Yeah. I think I saw another hand. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering like who pays for the initial pilot, whether it's OTI or like city agencies, or is this like a, um, like something that the, the startups or participants have to like um burden the cost themselves and, and uh, what are the success rates of these um programs in general i'm asking this because i was wondering how city agencies how receptive are they to mm -hmm. these uh, pilots and i know that change is difficult and um onboarding and offboarding a new process uh, often requires a lot of costs and resources uh, so how do you guys like navigate um, those types of challenges to ensure like the, the success of the program? Sure. Um, I'm going to try to remember all those. So um, just give me a, a hint on the first one. Who pays, Who pays for it? Yes. Great question. We get that a lot too. Um, so yeah, the way that we've set up the program is we, we try to have both us as the city and the uh, companies sort of uh, 
participate in kind with their time or their resources, right? So uh, we're not actually paying um, for like the the individual companies to provide their solutions, but we're doing like the project management, we're providing the assets um, and everything like that. So that's a, a, a burden. So like in the case of of, uh, of Clarity, they're providing the hardware and their software platform, and then we're sort of managing the the whole um, rest of the pilot, the installation, and, and things like that. Um, and and you know, hopefully, also we're providing them feedback on their solution. This is you know something that is or isn't working for the city for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, and that's also valuable for the companies. And then, you know, to limit the burden on the companies themselves, we're, that's why we're trying to keep these reasonably short, right? Um, so, you know, hopefully six months. And, and and when we say six to nine months, that's sort of like start to finish. So maybe the data collection portion or or what have you is going to be maybe three months or something. So we're very cognizant. We want to be able to work with um, whoever is applying to, to make it so that, you know, like they're not being put out with their time and their service uh, and trying to meet them with our time and our assets and things like that. So uh, kind of having uh, both parties having like an, uh, a pretty equal investment into the pilot. Um, and then, you know, there's stuff that we have to do, uh, incidental costs or things like that for the, um, you know, pay paying for, for, aspects of it that aren't like direct costs, but indirect costs, installation costs, and things like that, where the city's covering all of that as well. So, so um, I think part of the question was, uh, how receptive are the city agencies because change is often difficult? Sure, yeah, and I think it depends in, uh, you know, certain folks at, you know, there's a lot of great folks within the city who are really eager to, you know, implement in innovative technologies. Um, so I think, you know, it's in part finding the right partners. We don't want to be pulling anybody's teeth to, to get a pilot going. So like every, every, um, pilot that we do needs to have an agency stakeholder that's invested, that wants to be working with us to get the results from this pilot. So, you know, it's, it's about us having those, those right partners within the city. Um, and then, you know, for a lot of agencies, they just don't have, there's no innovation group within a specific agency, you know, not like, uh, you know, Jada's team is, is one of the teams at, at DCAS that's doing that kind of work. DOT has a team like that, that is doing, you might've seen the, 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 um, uh, micro mobility charging pilot that just came out where they're trying to help delivery riders either charge their bikes or swap their batteries. So some agencies do have that kind of, uh, innovation capacity, piloting capacity, but then a lot of them don't. And so, as I mentioned before, like we're kind of coming in offering like innovation as a service. And so a lot of them are really eager to try new things, but because they're typically really just focused on day-to-day -day operations, they don't have the capacity to do that. And so, you know, we become a good partner for them to, to try new ideas and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's a lot about finding the right partners and, and, um, and those relationships within the city. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for the talk. So I'm wondering, um, how OTI selects, um, projects to become a pilot. You mentioned there are like 49 applications. Mm -hmm. So what is that process of narrow, narrowing down projects to select and then who from what agency like makes that final decision? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we we have a criteria that we look at. Uh, one thing that you might have noticed, which is like all of these uh, pilots have some sort of connection to like public realm or physical space. So we're not testing sort of like back end software for agencies to use. Um, we're really focused on you know the the public realm and and uh, and the physical environment of the city, whether or not that's in the streetscape, like air quality, or our buildings, and sort of like everything in between. So that's sort of like one of the hard and fast rules. Um, we are also you know making sure that any technology that's coming through is is you know sufficiently. Um, new and emerging. So like we're, we're, you know, going to be limiting things that are sort of tried and true at this point. We want to make sure that we're sort of pushing the, the envelope, um, in terms of the technology that's, that's being used. And, you know, that could be anywhere in the world or that could be here. Things that we haven't tried in New York city, New York city has a lot of, 
um, specific contexts and things like that. And so, um, you know, if it's, if it's new in New York, that's, you know, good enough for us as a, as an emerging technology. Um, and then, you know, it's also got to solve a, uh, a goal, a, a strategic goal that an agency has. So, um, that's part of that matchmaking process. Um, Brianna and I are meeting quarterly with agencies to bring them the new, the applications that come in. And we basically, you know, summarize it for them and, uh, get their feedback. And so we, it's really important for us. We're not making the judgment calls on, you know, specific subject matters in which we're not experts. Right. So we're, we're aware of the challenges that agencies are, are trying to solve for, um, either just through conversation. We also have like a, a document that we share with them that says, what are the things that you're trying to solve for? And we have that in the back of our mind, um, when we're reviewing the, um, the applications. And then, so it's up to them and, and the agency, um, you know, uh, folks that are going to make that call. Is it worth their time to invest? Is the outcome, you know, going to, going to be worthy of, of, uh, of, of running this pilot. So that's sort of high level, like how we're, how we're doing it. We're trying to bring, you know, there's that initial screen that we do, um, in, in terms of like, where is this technology being operated? Um, what's the benefit? Has it been used here before? Things like that. Um, and then it's also, it, then it kind of comes down to the discretion of the, of the agencies and whether or not they want to be a part of it. Yeah. Another question here. Uh, thanks. So if you're focusing on, um, new sensors, um, my question would be who pays for the storage and analysis of the data. So for example, with the LIDAR data that Rufus is collecting, that's, mm. that's expensive. And so that, that's the type of data that the city, I assume, probably didn't have previously. But even after the pilot is gone, after the nine months, you still have to store that LiDAR data. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question would be, if we're paying for it and it's expensive, is would that, can that be graduated to open NYC open data after the pilot is over? Yeah, so I think I mentioned it specifically for the air quality pilot. Um, but, you know, the intention is to, is to as... As much as the data is, you know, um, able to be made available, we're not we, we're not going to share any like sensitive data or things like that. Um, but yeah, to have that be to be made available for for New Yorkers or you know whoever is interested to to have access to that data, um, you know, so far with the, the with the vendors that we're working with, you know, all of the data that that Clarity is collecting that's going into you know their cloud platform. Same thing with BDR. So, you know, they have the, their, their sort of software stack that, that are, is managing all of the, the data during the pilot. Yeah. I think I saw a hand in the back. During these test drives, um, does the agency that's sponsoring the project own the data or the company? Yeah. So we, we have, in some cases, you know, we'll, we'll set it up so that there'll be some sort of co-ownership. I think Bilal mentioned you know, they're using the data to improve their, their algorithm. So the city does own the data, um, from the pilots, but in many cases we're, you know, co-owning it or, or, or sharing it back with the, with the, the vendors to, you know, learn from. So that's one of the benefits for them as well. If they're providing their time in kind, it's a learning opportunity for them as well. Um, you know, seeing how they navigate within New York city in our building stock, for example. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's also a part of the, the way that, you know, we're kind of, um, collaborating, um, on it. Question here. Apart from the data as the output of the pilot, is there any sort of reporting, uh, summaries of how it went that is, uh, presented to the public? Uh, yeah. So we have the evaluations that we're going to be doing at the end and, and, I'll just reiterate that like, these are the first pilots as part of the program that we launched in October. So we haven't actually gone through a full life cycle of start to finish yet. Um, but yeah, the idea is that we, we will have these evaluations, um, uh, be made available. Um, and you know, the, the sort of depth of it, I guess, is something that we'll work on with the vendors themselves, what type of information, you know, all parties are comfortable, um, uh, releasing. 
Um, but certainly every pilot does have an evaluation. Um, and again, the idea is to share that internally throughout different city agencies because some of these technologies might be useful for more than one you know, area of, of government. So that'll be a part of it as well. Yeah. So just kind of following up a little bit on one of the earlier questions, how, can you talk something about the process of choosing sites for these? Sure. That has a kind of big impact on what you learn. Yeah, um, and so I can kind of speak to some of the pilots that we've done so far. So the the um, the pilot that we're doing with with Clarity and Static Air was based on some of the NICAST data, and so we were looking for areas that had uh, sort of um, historically higher levels of PM 2.5. I think as, as Levi mentioned, the area that, that we're working in in, in Masbeth is, is quite industrial. And so we were sort of scanning that area. Are there any city assets within that area? And there happened to be uh, a, a Department of Education school there. So that's something we can work with DOE to install the, the sensors, to install the, the static air units. And it's also a population that could potentially really benefit from uh, improved air quality. So, um, you know, that's how that location um, came to came to be. I think working with with uh, uh, Jada's team, you know, they they were selecting rooftops that are on the schedule for solar at some point in the near future. So they want to be able to get this data ahead of time so that they're not installing equipment on a roof that might fail. Um, so that's sort of you know um, that uh, part. With the mobility data, we were working with DOT on that, and they were selecting locations um, based on, you know, either projects that they had done recently, a new bike lane, or, you know, they kind of uh, changed the, the design of a specific part of a street or a place where they just didn't have the data, but they knew that there was a lot of bikes and pedestrians and things like that. So we do really rely on the agency partners and their knowledge of their, you know, subject matter to kind of guide where these different pilots would take place. So I think it's, yeah, it's really a mix of where we have assets, um, where, where is, you know, the, uh, the need for it, um, you know, two, two parts of it. And so, yeah, each, each, um, pilot is going to slightly differ where it's, it's piloted. So, um, you know, we kind of have the whole city to sort of work from, which, you know, in some cases uh, is great. In some cases, it makes it harder because we do, you know, some of the pi some of the test beds that, that I showed before, they're very specific to a geography, right? So like the one in Copenhagen, they created this area like near their city hall. So all of the, all of the pilots that they were doing in that sort of um, urban living lab happen around there if it's sort of agnostic in terms of what thing they're trying to study, that works. But, you know, if you're putting flood sensors in a part of the city that doesn't flood, you're not going to learn a lot. So you kind of have to go where, where the need is um, in, that, in that regard. Um, are we over time? Okay, sorry. I uh, appreciate everybody's questions. Thanks again. Um, I believe there's going to be the discotheque. Uh, happening in the uh, Rufus and the and the air quality sensor will be there and, and some of us will be there as well to to to, um, to chat. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>